Uh, yes, thank you, Alistair. That's great. Uh, everybody's fortified. That's good. Because this is going to be a long journey. Um, because I'm going to talk about cultural exhaustion, remakes, Hollywood, heroes, narrative, the lot. And as you may know from the blurb, and as you maybe have seen this year's Academy Awards, the comedian, the host Jimmy Kimmel, joked, all the 10 highest grossing films of this year were sequels and franchises. They say Hollywood is running out of new ideas. I mean, poor Steven Spielberg had to make a movie about Steven Spielberg. <laughs> which, of course, he meant The Fablemans, uh, Spielberg's semi-autobiographical movie, which did not win any awards. Um, so this statement, I think, captures the feeling of many that our artistic creativity in general, and film in particular, are in a particular self-inflicted doldrums. It seems ours is an era of endless remakes, repeats, reboots, franchises, cinematic universes, cinematic multiverses. Uh, so everybody seems to be asking what actually happened to creativity. So in the next 30 or so minutes, I want to explore why it feels like we're watching the same film again and again, uh, what this has to do with the way Hollywood constructs its narratives, and how the times we live in today are out of tune with this way of storytelling. Or better still, how the way we relate to one another in our current political moment has changed the way we relate to the characters on screen. So first of all, I thought, you know, let's actually investigate this and see, is it actually true? Are we just living in an era of remakes? And I looked at it, and it is true, <laughs> right? Um, uh, but actually, it's not remakes as such, because remakes, I mean, since the silent era, remakes have been the staple of filmmaking, of Hollywood, Europe, Asian cinema. Um, it, it has just been basically retellings of old fairy tales and myths. Um, I think there's like 100 versions of The Christmas Carol, 60 versions of Dracula, and most of them were done in the silent era. But what has exponentially risen over the past 30 years here, um, is sequels. Sequels and with it, franchises. And that's significant. So we are almost at a time here, sort of a late 2000s, where you know, remakes, sequels, reboots um, are far more dominant than original movies. So, um, and the Sequels seem to be uh, making more and more money as well. So 2017, the highest grossing films were Iron Man, Star Wars 7, uh, and Avengers, Age of, uh, I think Age of Ultron. And they grossed around $2 billion each, right? That's possible because they would be successful internationally. Fast forward four years, and films like Avatar, Way of Water, um, yeah, the uh, two other Avengers film, Infinity War, and uh, which one's the Endgame? Three billion dollars. I mean, these numbers are mind-boggling. So I think it's only wise for movie uh, production companies to make these kind of movies. I mean, there's a guaranteed audience for this, and they seem to be making a lot of money. So the numbers tell us that commercially, at least, it makes sense to invest in making movies that have a guaranteed audience. I'm just going to put this away. But uh, I mean, I don't know if you remember, you know, about, up until like 25 years ago, sequels used to be a joke, didn't they? You know, when Beethoven the Third came out, you know, you know it was like a shameless cash in, right? <laughs> Every sequel, uh, yeah, no. And, but something changed in the late 90s. And suddenly, sequels became a lot more profitable and popular than the originals. And that started with Toy Story 2, which really outsold Toy Story 1, and then just continued with the Harry Potter franchise, Pirates of the Caribbean, Lord of the Rings, which each film subsequently just was far more successful than the previous one. So, um, so it's worth pointing out the difference between sequels and remakes. Now, as I said, remakes have always been the staple of cinema. Um, but what we are experiencing now is that remakes are not remakes in a traditional sense. Um, they feel like sequels now. 
The shift is, as the film critic Sushil Mehota describes, from story-focused movies to experience, to the experience-driven kind. We're not shown a radical reimagination of the original conflict, which makes us, the audience, active participants in the story, active subjects in the movie. Rather, today's remakes are an adaptation of the original for the contemporary mores of politically correct modes of representation and identification. Might have seen some of these. So in these films, we are passive spectators, passive subjects that hope for an experience of our own prescribed identity being fed back to us. Just a quick example. And this is actually what I want to talk about. What are the old modes of storytelling? Why are they still dominant? But why do they not work anymore? And why that is the malaise we are actually experiencing and everybody is feeling and trying to put into words. So what is this exhaustion? What, what are we exhausted about? And a way to approach this question in relation to cinema is to understand how the mode of Hollywood storytelling operates. How they make us, the audience, relate to and participate in the narrative. When we do this, we can very quickly see that, seems, that this seems to be problematic today. Ultimately, what is blocking our enjoyment is the way our historical moment obstructs us from a traditional identification process with the narrative and the characters within the narrative. So in short, what is blocked is the enjoyment of narrative identification. So uh, to start, let's look at how Hollywood film narratives are constructed. And by Hollywood films, I'm using the modern understanding of any big budget movies that involve somewhat American money, right? That's the modern understanding of Hollywood films. Um, Hollywood films work through established modes and conventions. Most notable, of course, a visual style that suggests um, seamlessness. So what the famous academic David Bordwell calls classic Hollywood cinema. And we all know a good example of this. And classic Hollywood cinema is still the dominant way Hollywood tells stories. We have invisible editing, chronological clarity, in short, a masterclass in realism. We are totally immersed in the story. We identify with the protagonist. Nothing breaks the illusion. There's no Brechtian alienation in sight. <coughs> What has established itself in Hollywood cinema is the idea of a character-driven narrative. That is very important to Bordwell as well. We have to identify with the main person. Their journey is our journey. This is why I want to talk about the hero's journey. This is the first very obvious but most commonly overlooked and neglected aspect of filmic storytelling, especially in its Hollywood form. We have to have a hero, a central protagonist, someone we identify with, but why? Yes. So and at this point, it has to be stressed that the hero in this context is not anything superhuman. It doesn't have to mean Superman or Batman or even John McClane. The hero is firstly, simply the central protagonist of a film, the point of identification the access to the narrative. But more importantly, the hero is the subject of change. Furthermore, this change is something the hero does to themselves after interacting with the world. The concept of the hero's journey, or as it's known, or also uh, the monomyth, big word, uh, was described by mythologist Joseph Campbell in his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, great title, uh, from 1949. This has become a foundational text for Hollywood. Screenwriting, storytelling, so we need to take a close look at it. Firstly, to understand it in itself, and secondly, because it will help understand the contemporary problem we want to investigate. It's worth reflecting for a moment that it was a mythologist who gave Hollywood its go-to reference manual. So Joseph Campbell was following the teaching of psychoanalyst Carl Jung, 
And he posited that there is something like a collective unconscious. That is, an unconscious common to mankind as a whole and originating in the inherited structure of the brain. Furthermore, and this is the important bit for the argument, he posited that the shared similarities among common mythological themes and symbols originate from this collective unconscious within the human mind. There is some sort of universalist underpinning to all of these ideas. Now, of course, like all psychoanalysis, we have to take it with a grain of salt, and these things have their limits. They're very prescriptive, they tend to medicalize the social, and that there's some sort of common social pattern in the brain we are born with sounds a bit too deterministic to be true. But, on the other hand, a concept that attempts to describe a very, very real phenomenon, that there is a human social landscape that is outside the single individual, a, a shared social sentiment of the world, that is, I think, incredibly useful when it comes to thinking about something like storytelling. Campbell's attempt at describing a collective social narrative that we all have access to and understand and most of all enjoy as part of our experience of the social, a collective human sensation is, I believe, a worthwhile idea in this context. There is, you know, there is enough truth in there to be useful to us. So this collective unconscious, said Campbell, is distinct from the personal unconscious, which comprises individual life experiences. The collective unconscious contains element or cognitive structures that have evolved over human history and are universally present. Uh, Carl Jung referred to these evolved cognitive structures as archetypes. Of course, you know, if you've all read your Aristotle, you know, we've <laughs> where we've got this from. Um, so, but he says they manifest in various images and symbolic patterns forming the foundation of many myths. So these archetypes explain for him how similar myths can emerge in diverse cultures separated by extensive periods. So for Jung, myths as profound psychic phenomena reveal the essence of the soul, shedding light on the timeless truths that encompass human yearnings, fears, and aspirations. For Jung, the central focus lies in the timeless aspect that drive each human being and the concept of drive, I think, is also something we can steal from psychoanalysis, that there is an undeniable urge of human beings to constantly expand their understanding of the world uh, and within themselves in the world. So myths here serve as a medium to make the unconscious conscious, re recounting the tales of individuals undertaking heroic journeys in their quest to actualize the higher potential and discover their unique pathways to bliss. Such myths, abundant across different cultures throughout history, share a common pattern known as the myth of the hero's journey. In myths that follow this pattern, the hero embarks on a voyage from a familiar world to strange and sometimes threatening lands symbolizing the individual's departure from their conscious personality into the unexplored regions of the unconscious in pursuit of what is known in this context, the ultimate boon, the hidden, unrealized potential within. The ultimate boon is how Campbell describes our most primal drive, the thing that drives us our want, even if we don't actually consciously know what we want, or we want something different. You always get it in movies that a hero thinks he wants something, but in the end, after his journey, he actually wants something completely different. So, but it's the journey that reveals this ultimate boon. Uh, the hero's journey is often distilled into three main stages, involving the hero departing from the familiar world, navigating the unfamiliar world of adventure, and eventually returning to the familiar world. <laughs> So the storytelling model, you can see, is very much a three-act play structure, always you know, tracing it back again to Aristotelian po poetics. And the hero's journey is most of all an expression of becoming. 
growing as a human being through traumatic experiences and coming out on the other side profoundly changed. And this is very important to this investigation, the question of becoming and that this involves trauma. So as one delves deeper into the psyche, surmounts challenges and experiences, moments of profound insight, the former self undergoes disintegration, leading to the emergence of a new and far more impressive self. This stage is symbolized in myth as death or rebirth, when the hero ventures into a dark realm, like the belly of a whale, yeah? or a tomb, or a dark cave, that on, only to come out, re-emerge, reborn. It's, this is where the change has happened. The transformation leads to the, to, the, to the discovery of the ultimate boon, representing unrealized potential within the individual. So Pinocchio finds his bravery once he is in the belly of the whale. So finding the ultimate boon is always meant to signify, as Campbell says, an expansion of consciousness and therewith of being, illumination, transfiguration, and freedom. So the traumatic journey is necessary for freedom to be realized. So uh, now you can actually see how this whole myth thing is essentially a template for pretty much every Hollywood movie you've seen, and how ingrained this concept is in Hollywood star storytelling and narratives. And I think the very famous, most famous example is, of course, uh, that it gave inspiration to George Lucas when he was writing the hero's journey of Luke Skywalker in Star Wars. He very openly admits that he was a big fan of Joseph Campbell's book. And this is a very, very famous still. This is the most important shot of the whole film. Because it is here that Luke, you know, looking into the distance, he follows the call of adventure. This is part, you know, the first stage of the hero's journey. Um, you know, he, he, he neglected the first call of adventure because it wasn't necessary then. You know, when R2D2 just says, you know, oh, it shows him the film of Leia wanting to be rescued. No, here, he, his aunt and uncle have just been murdered, and he realizes that he cannot no longer resist the call to adventure. And it is this very short way we can see him accepting his fate. Beautiful stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, but following Lucas's example, Campbell's handbook, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, just became this guiding tool for creative writers and entertainers who hoped to recreate Lucas's financial success. Well, uh, of course, it's easy to criticize any attempt to uh, formulize storytelling into a step-by-step -step exercise. But the concept of the hero's journey is foundational in Hollywood. It's foundational rather than a prescription. And different filmmakers will follow the rules uh, with more or less fidelity. And this foundation has, to, has become absolutely embedded in Hollywood. And the best example is that um, ex-Disney um, executive, De uh, Christopher Fogler, he uh, used Campbell's book and wrote a memo, seven-page memo for Disney in the 1990s, so saying, so this is a practical guide for, for the staff. You write films like this now. And if you remember, in the 1990s, it was the rebirth of Disney. So Fogler, with his reinvention of the hero myth for Disney, was responsible for films like The Lion King, um, Beauty and the Beast, and all the kind of 90s Disney the Disney Renaissance. Um, so here the idea does become formulaic. However, it has established itself as such a recogni recognizable format that people don't mind. They got real tellings of stories, but they were different enough. So one of the obvious questions, of course, now is why did this formula catch on so strongly with American producers and consumers of film? So why do Americans like it, right? Um, well, up until recently, the hero's journey aligns very closely with the American founding myths. You know, the frontier, this is here, yeah, John Wayne, um, the hero as an, uh, as an individual on a journey, 
individualism, most of all, individual freedom. As with the hero's myth of old, the foundation myth of America, the ultimate boon in Campbell's terms, is freedom, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But while the archetypes of the individual hero seem to speak especially to the American consciousness, it's safe to say it also has universal appeal. And this is why the hero archetype makes Hollywood films so accessible and so watchable around the world. Heroes are, after all, a universal archetype. I mean, isn't the collective Red Army in Eisenstein's October not also the hero of the story? So while the hero on the, and the hero's journey is central to Hollywood narrative, the other key element of this mode of storytelling is the reliance on archetypes. So the hero <laughs> archetype meets other distinct archetypes that shape his journey, and each one is recognizable in their role. So Jung's theory suggested that archetypes were archaic, universal forms of innate human knowledge passed down from our ancestors. So the existence of these archetypes cannot be observed directly. They can only be observed in their form, their current form, by looking at things like religion, dreams, literature, art. And Campbell adopts Jung's general categories of archetypes for the hero journey. So on his journey, on his travels, our hero, yeah, he's same shot, call to adventure. <laughs> Don't forget, that's how Hollywood works. So our hero will meet something like a mentor, right? <laughs> the mentor who transmits encouragement, understanding, and wisdom to the hero. The hero will meet an ally, somebody who will join him in his quest for the ultimate boon. He will meet a trickster. A trickster sometimes supplies comic relief, but ultimately, he will trigger a catalyst of change because he's so chaotic sometimes, you know. Accidentally, he will just set things in motion. Our hero will meet guardians. Guardians are characters who serve to challenge or obstruct the hero's journey and, you know, stop his progress. And most of all, he will meet a shadow. The shadow often considered the villain of the piece, but actually it's the bit that shows the unrepressed desires of the hero. He's like, like his counterpart, but who wants the same thing as the hero. He wants the same ultimate boon. Lord Farquaad also wants, you know, to live happily ever after with Princess Fiona as his wife. But he doesn't want to change. He knows this. Shrek has to go through a whole palaver to actually understand that that's what he wants. You know, the shadow is the one who says to the main character, you know, we're not so different, you and I, because we're not, <laughs> right? So, so archetypes are more than just characters. They are those who shape the individual on their journey of becoming, their journey to realize their full potential. In filmic terms, they are often sidekicks, secondary characters, and so on. Now this formula, this way of thinking about stories and myths, has been to a large extent and is still crucial to understanding Hollywood and Hollywood narratives. And this is equally true, although it might not be as immediately obvious, of new Hollywood. You know, the directors that created the big films of the era, um, like after the era after the big studios. So people like Spielberg, Lucas, Coppola, Kubrick. So they would define the cultural moment of 60s, 70s, 80s America and create epic tales of American heroes based on the hero archetype. Often, they often turned them on the head, and the anti-hero trope was born. Protagonists who lack attributes such as idealism, courage, and morality. However, this retelling of the American dream still relied on a collective consciousness that could relate to these archetypes of heroism on concepts of fundamental human qualities, such as bravery, cowardice, and the like. As Jung says, archetypes are always in flux. They are of their time and express the collective consciousness of their time. They are on the one hand eternal, 
but the individual manifestations cannot take on anything other than contemporary form. They are also always of the moment. So how relevant is the hero's journey today? So the hero's journey is still fundamental to Hollywood. It is still the template. It still makes the most money. It's still the most successful, uh, but it feels different. It feels like we are no longer part of the hero's journey in the same way. We are watching something else. It is also obvious, just looking at the state of contemporary Hollywood cinema, that the nature of films being produced and watched has changed drastically. Clearly, the heyday of Spielberg seems to be over. Steven Spielberg is the model that everybody imagines when they think of the perfect Hollywood film. You know, he pioneered the classic Hollywood blockbuster, a film that could be original, standalone, have artistic merit, and could be massively commercially, commercially successful. You know, from E.T., Jaws, Indiana Jones, and so on. Uh, in their day, they were the biggest movies made, and at the same time, the most original, the most novel. Today, the idea that an original film could also be commercially huge seems to be too strange to be true. So, you know, there's no such phenomenon like E.T. And it's not because Spielberg is making bad films today. Absolutely not. There's still master classes of cinematic storytelling. So from films like Ready Player One from 2018 to his remake of West Side Story, these films are absolutely flawless and they are beautiful. If you haven't seen them, I would really recommend them. They're beautiful films. But we cannot relate to them in the same way. Why? Because now we are expected to be spectators, not participants of the hero's journey. When Spielberg asks us to identify with his characters, it feels <coughs> wrong. And this is where I think uh, it's actually important to look outside cinema for an explanation of what's going on and to try to begin to understand why it feels as if cinema can no longer imagine new stories. The reason I took time to explore the uh, hero's journey as a mode of storytelling is because I want to argue that it's antithetical to the contemporary understanding of what it means to be a person and that the idea of archetypes is antithetical to how we are supposed to relate to one another. There are tensions on the one hand between very embedded habitual modes of storytelling, premised on a particular understanding of what it means to be, means to be a human, that are perfected and expressed most clearly in Hollywood cinema. So, and on the other hand, contemporary ideas of what it means to be human. And I would say the world outside cinema has changed. And what has changed most profoundly is how human beings relate to themselves and to one another. What has become problematic is things like subjectivity and intersubjectivity, the idea of human beings as human becomings, active subjects changing themselves has become problematized as well the, as the idea that other human beings can be profoundly understandable through our human social condition, that we can identify with someone in a profound way outside rigid, shallow identity categories. So let's look at the first category, the idea of the subject and the self, and see how profoundly out of tune with contemporary sensibilities it is. To do that, it's necessary to talk about the idea of the true self. So film, especially Hollywood narrative, is caught in the tension between the demands of its own cinema form and logic and the demands of the exterior world, of an audience who cannot be expected to change or become, to whom the idea of becoming may be too violent or too strange. Uh, think of the motto of our age, be your true self. And this is the perfect distillation of an attitude towards what it means to be a person and a human being. And it is an attitude that forgoes the idea of becoming in favor of being. Insofar as we're supposed to change it all, it's to do work on ourselves to become slightly less dysfunctional in some sort of, in our true version of ourselves. And uh, the highest goal given to us at the moment, uh, the new categorical imperative, if you will, is that you can 
only be your true self and to become somebody else and experience the demand to become somebody else is violence. But thinking back to the hero's journey, trauma, the trauma of subjective change is essential to the hero's journey as well as an essential part of becoming and it is essential to then realize freedom. In the realm of myth, as Campbell points out, the threshold guardian assumes the whole role of harbinger of panic, right? The dragon in Shrek. And for those ill-prepared to confront him, just as in the course of our real lives, facing our rejected personality can prove arduous and distressing. So straight away, it is obvious that the hero's journey, the fundamental mode of Hollywood narrative, is at odds with the cultural moment we're in, especially in how we're encouraged to think of ourselves as human beings. The other important tension that is important to reckon with and uh, somehow is around intersubjectivity, so how we relate to one another and what, it, what this does uh, in our way to inhabit narratives. So the contemporary way of understanding how we relate to one another is best understood through the idea of empathy. You know, Barack Obama, you know, 10 years ago said, oh, we've got this empathy gap, you know, it's a big thing. Um, so there's only empathy as a solution of how we can relate to one another. So sl slowly but surely, what has happened is that the idea that we have an ability to understand one another intellectually and socially has been eroded and replaced by the idea that the only legitimate mode of intersubjectivity is through feeling another's pain or empathy. The problem with this for Hollywood is that the spectator identification, our ability to inhabit a narrative and understand archetypes to be with the uh, hero on their journey does not work like this. So that empathy is not enough to make that work. The monomyth is premised on an essentially universalist outlook and in spite of everything, still works through the reality of our shared humanity. It only works if we can inhabit the main character. Their needs are our needs. We are identical for the time of the narrative. So because sociological political questions outside the realm of fiction, um, of who we are allowed to identify with and how and what that identification means, the same questions in relation to fiction and narrative have become incredibly fraught. From this tension, in some sort of attempt to manage this tension, comes the idea of representation. Representation is the demand placed on fiction to traffic in specific identity categories, and that furthermore, the demand that these identity categories are the legitimate way our audience should approach and appreciate narrative. So my proposition is here that these demands of on-screen representation make it impossible as an audience to give ourselves permission to understand and enjoy narrative and archetypes. We are not allowed, right? There's an inner policeman now that tells us this is wrong. And I think the best example I've had lately is watching The Little Mermaid because it really embodies these two conflicting ideas that the film carries. On the one hand, you know, it, it's a fantastic, sweet film, and H Halle Bailey is, is awesome in it, you know, watch it. Apart from that, <laughs> it is still, you know, the, the kind of same coming of age story, you know, as before. It's to told in the traditional hero journey mode. The whole film is absolutely a Hollywood film. It's built around the kind of trauma that she goes through, her journey as a mermaid, and she undergoes the trauma of coming of age. So this is one message. So this film can be enjoyed along these lines. If you go in and want to enjoy the film, this is how you can enjoy it. The problem is it also carries a conflicting message here, and that is that the mermaid has been deliberately given an identity category. It just so happens that this identity category in, is black in this case, but that's absolutely not important. The important thing is that by making the hero an avatar of an identity category, we are being uninvited from spectator identification. We're not invited to share her trauma, that would be violence. We are relegated to the benches, to the role of spectator, which is fun, right? 
but it's not profound in any way. So the point here is that, first of all, that we still identify with the characters. That's what human beings do, because that's still true. We, we automatically do this. But the important point is that it's not allowed to be true. And we, this contradiction that exists when we watch movies now. And the movies carry these contradictions within themselves now. So the two problems are immediately clear when watching Hollywood narratives today. One, they're still designed around narrative structures that insist on universal needs and desires as lived vicariously through the protagonist. As w and we, the audience, are actively joining the hero and experiencing the ultimate boon. Secondly, I mean, the society is at odds with any claims of a universal experience. We're only allowed any kind of intersubjective experience through notions like empathy. It is through representation of identities that storytellers now try to bridge this gap because we are not allowed uh, to identify only with our own prescribed identity group. Um, the pressure to make films with as many diverse identities is now the kind of solution to this um, problem. However, I mean, there's nothing to be said against this in its own narrow terms, but it's not a solution to the problem of the foundational disjunction between a Hollywood narrative form built around a universalist framework and a fragmented human condition. So it's fragmented into identities. So to come to a conclusion after all of this, our current cultural political moment has called into question subjectivity and intersubjectivity. Obviously, this has profound social and political consequences. Perhaps less obviously, it has a profound effect on storytelling and Hollywood storytelling. The main effect of our contemporary mood is that it raises barriers to narrative identification. It's hard for us to inhabit new stories and identify with the hero in a profound way. This is why the heroes we are offered now come with the caveat that their journey is not your journey. Their ultimate boon is not your ultimate boon. The best you can hope for is being an ally to the protagonist on screen, as well as your fellow human beings in real life. Rather than making their journey your journey, making their struggle your struggle, the best you can do is be an empathetic bystander. Ultimately, the end result is the artistic deadlock we set out to investigate. Franchises and sequels are necessary to Hollywood in that they can continue to rely on their central monomyth as the mode, main mode of narrative while ducking the dilemma posed by the external demands of a fragmentary identitarianism. Hollywood is now co so Hollywood is now copying the copy, the copy in the form of sequels and franchises as a safe way of continuing stories that have proved to be successful in the past. But this procession of simulacra, as Baudrillard calls it, uh, can only be done with diminishing returns. So the, hence the hero's journey can only be photocopied so many times before it becomes meaningless. In terms of originality, you know, maybe Hollywood is not the place at the moment, but I'm looking at art and independent production companies like A24, who I think are really good at artistically capturing the zeitgeist of this phenomenon. They're not offering a good critique, but films like Bo is Afraid that came out this year is a nice, deliberate, really grotesque parody of the hero's journey in our contemporary times. And uh, according to my husband, the most alienated movie ever made. Um, yes, so the other, of course, the other big question, Barbie versus Oppenheimer, I don't know, you know, can Barbie save uh, the hero's journey or the heroine's journey? I don't know because, you know, Mattel is already planning a whole stable of uh, Mattel toy films. Um, you know, the next one is Polly Pocket, directed by Lena Dunham, she's written the script. Um, uh, this is true. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Uh, yeah, and, and the other ones. No, and the, what's it called? The Barney, the purple dinosaur. They're making that as well. And they're they're both they're supposed they're going to be adult films. They're not kids' films. So, who knows what this is going to lead to? Um, and uh, yeah, well, let's see if we can save the hero's journey. Thank you. Thank you.